Before we get started, if you, have, if you did not order the Mystery of the Seven Feast of Israel with Bill Cloud and I, that will still be available in time to come. So just letting you know that. I was uh, intrigued by a, a website that I went to, and I'm not going to tell you what it is because it's a website that tries to down the scripture and talk about how false the Bible is. And there was allegedly 188 contradictions that this man had found that's in the scripture. And how can people believe the Bible when it's full of contradictions? I found out something about the contradictions. Number one, sometimes you have to study the Greek or Hebrew word that clears up what appears to be a contradiction. Number two, there are times by going to Israel and seeing the land lay out and learning the history of Israel that it clears up the contradiction. And number three, sometimes it's really not a contradiction. It's adding a layer of the story that perhaps another gospel writer did not write about. Now, I'm not going to cover 187. I'm going to take six of these and I'm going to explain these alleged contradictions to you. Number one, was God pleased with his works or was he displeased? Genesis 131, God saw all that he made was good. And it says that in six places there in Genesis chapter one and two, Genesis 6, 6. And the Lord was grieved that he had man and he was grieved in his heart. So that's a contradiction. God says it's good. God says it's bad. The first chapter, second and third chapter of Genesis in the garden, everything was in perfection. Therefore, it was good. By Genesis six, men had corrupted themselves. Evil was in the earth. The imagination of the heart is evil continually. And it had displeased God that he had made man because of how man was now acting. It is no contradiction at all when you understand the context of the setting of the scripture. Number two, God had to rest. God does not need to rest. Genesis chapter two and two. On the seventh day that God ended his work, he rested on the seventh day. Psalms 121 and four. Behold, he that keeps Israel, and this is speaking of God, never sleeps nor slumbers. So one chapter, he never, he never sleeps, or one verse, I should say. And in the book of Genesis, he rests. Why does God rest on the seventh day? Two reasons. There's nothing else to create. What else is he going to create? He's finished creating everything. So what it means there, not like he's tired. It means he ceases from his labor. He's not sleeping. He's not wore out. He ceases from his labor. And so he established the seventh day of not laboring to establish Shabbat or the Sabbath day for us to have a day of rest. That's what that's all about. And of course, in the other chapter, uh, it, it actually is sharing with us that he does not get old. He doesn't need rest. He doesn't sleep. He does not get old. Uh, he is, you know, just completely. Um, and actually, the word sleep in the New Testament is a metaphor for death. He that keepeth Israel should never sleep or slumber. We know that means snoring and resting. So God's eyes are on the righteous continually. He's a spirit. He needs no rest. He needs no sleep. He only ceases the seventh day because there's nothing left to create. And it's a pattern for ceasing from your labor. Number three, God dwells in light. God dwells in darkness. First Timothy 6, 16. This is God who alone is immortal and dwells in the light that no man can approach. First Kings 8 and 12. The Lord says he dwells in thick darkness. Now, the light in heaven where God dwells is so bright that that's the light that no man can approach. Paul was blinded by that light on the road to Damascus when a voice from heaven called him, Saul, why do you persecute me? And he saw a light. He says that. So that's the glo The glory of God is light. When it says he dwells in darkness, it means the heavens itself. If you go into the stellar heavens, you will see little stars. But there's an empty place in the north that's completely black and completely dark. And that is the heaven is located in the end of that northern tunnel that they have discovered. So he dwells in the area where it's dark, but in the area where he lives is total, complete light. And there again, it's not a contradiction when you understand all the other scriptures that have to tie in with it and what they mean. Number four. God is tempting people, Genesis 21 and 2. And it came to pass that God did tempt Abraham. That's the King James translation. James 1 and 3. God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempts he any man. So God cannot be tempted. He doesn't tempt men, but then he tempted Abraham. Here's where a word study is important. The English translation uses the word tempt, but the, he, the original Hebrew is a word for test. 
it is actually better rendered. And God did test Abraham. Just like you go through a trial, you go through something. Job went through a test when he lost everything he had. And the word tempt there uh, in James 1 and 13 is the word tempt in the sense of Satan being a tempter trying to tempt you to sin. So in Genesis 22 and 1, he's not tempting Abraham to sin. He's putting him through a test with his son to lay his son down. In James 1, 13, it is a temptation causing you to sin. God does not put a temptation on you to make you sin because God hates sin. That's what it's saying there. Again, it's not a contradiction when you understand the context, okay? The birth of Christ. He was in a house or he was in a manger. Now, this is a big one that people have pointed out. Matthew, <coughs> forgive me. Matthew 2, 11. She gave birth, to, this is to Jesus, and placed him in a manger in a stable uh, because there was no room in the stable or in the inn. Luke 2 and 7, the wise man came to the house and brought him gold, frankincense, and myrrh. Now, the shepherds were at the stable right after his birth, if you'll read Luke 2, 15 through 16. So they were at a stable. A manger was a feeding trough for animals. They wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger. That's when the shepherds showed up. The wise men showed up not at that moment. All the Christmas plays, and I don't mean to be offensive, they have it wrong because the shepherds don't show up and then the wise men show up. That's how it's worded. The wise men showed up when they were living in a house. They, they, they had come from the stable. They are now living in a house in Bethlehem. Now, why do you think Herod, this is an important point, when he, when he hears the wise men say they've come to worship the king of the Jews, then Herod kills the babies under two years of age. If he had just been born, Herod would have killed the infants. But he killed every male child two and under. This is because it took time for the wise men to get there. And they were already in the house when they met Jesus, Mary and uh, Joseph. So it's not a contradiction. He wasn't born in the house. He wasn't born in the stable. He was born in the stable, but was as an infant placed in a house. And we don't know exactly how many uh, days, weeks or months it was that it took the wise men to find where he was. So that's not a contradiction. Number five, Jesus on a mountain or Jesus in a valley? Matthew 5 and 12. Let me hold this up so I don't have to look totally down huh? like a news reporter here. Matthew 5 and verse 12. He went to a mountain and he opened his mouth and he taught them. Matthew chapter 6, 17 and 18. He came down with them and stood in the plain and taught them. Now, you have to go to the Sea of Galilee to understand this. And on my Holy Land trips, we have done this. In the area traditionally marked as the Mount of Beatitudes in the sea, on the Sea of Galilee, it's right off the edge of the water, there is this beautiful mountain where there's a church which was built by the Italians. And I'm telling you, those Italian nuns, they love Perry Stone. I go in there and I'm telling you, uh, the little sisters, and they're, they're, all of them are very short if you've ever uh, met them, you know, these little Italian women, the nuns. Uh, I hug them, they kiss me on the cheek. Oh, my boy, my boy, you know, because my family came from Italy on mom, my grandparents did from my mom's side of the family. So uh, there's a little story behind that. I, I'm getting carried away here because I'm just, just those, they're, they're so sweet, you know, the mothers are. And uh, if you go to there, there, which we do every Holy Land trip, and we actually take from there, here's what you'll discover that you have the mountain, uh, which was the Mount of Beatitudes, but then the people sat in the side of the mountain and Jesus was at the bottom teaching them as they sat on the mountain. We did this one time to prove that you can get in that valley and people on the hill can hear you preach at a normal tone because there was no PA system. And you can, it's like a natural kind of an amphitheater there at the Mount of Beatitudes. So it's, the story is correct. He went up to a mountain to teach them. It's all a mountain, but he, he stood in the valley to teach them because if he stood on the mountain there in the valley, it doesn't work that way. That, that hillside, it's really amazing. And also when I, I throw this nugget out there, it, when he went in a boat and they launched out in a boat and he taught them that way, that didn't make sense to me for years because they're on the land, he's way out here. But if you ever go to the Sea of Galilee, you can hear the fishermen in the lake a mile away their conversations if the wind is not blowing and there's no nobody else you hear them talking water carries the sound in africa years ago on the lake victoria i believe it was they had a meeting and there were so many people and they said get in the boat and preach he said they're not gonna hear me he said they'll hear you better and they got in the boat and he you you speak toward the water and it just it's it's amazing it's like a natural effect so that's why Jesus launched out in the boat. Again, skeptics would say, well, you can't do that. That doesn't make sense. Well, you have to know a little bit about how it works. 
Here's the last one. Judas hung himself, but then Judas, Judas's bowels came out. And I hope you're not having breakfast while I talk about this one. Is, is that a contradiction? Matthew 27, verse 5. Judas hung himself, Acts 118. Falling headlong, his bowels came out in the field. So the contradiction is, okay, if he hung himself, he's going to be hanging on the branch of the tree. Did he jump off the cliff? This is a complete contradiction. Again, atheists, agnostics, unbelievers, they've not been there. They don't study history. Uh, this is a contradiction in the Bible. It is not a contradiction. When Lightfoot says this, when Judas, we, we know the spot where this happened. We have taped programs for manifest there. It's in the Valley of Hinnom and it's a steep cliff. So Judas is, he ties a rope to the tree, right? Then he jumps out and he, he hangs himself and the branch broke. And when the branch broke, he went, and that's where his bowels gushed out when he hit the bottom of that very steep ravine with rocks. There again, it's not a contradiction. Here's what I want to just say to all of you watching me. Anytime you are told that there's a contradiction in the Bible, it can be settled by research. Trust me, it can be settled by research. And <coughs> sometimes what looks like even in the Hebrew letters or something that's a mistake, it's not a mistake, it's actually a clue pointing to something else. So I want to encourage you, you can trust the Bible. And that's the reason why I'm going to just say this real quick. Some of you look at these relics over here. Look at this. That's over 3,000 years old. And that's going in the museum with the history of it. We're building a Holy Land Relics Museum exhibit at the, at the T.L. Lowry Center in Cleveland, Tennessee. We're going to take that in interior redo. It's going to be unbelievable. It's going to take about a year to do it all and get the cases in and, and do everything we need to do. And the reason we're doing that is we want people to understand the Bible, that it's real, it's true, that what you read is accurate. And we're going to have thousands of people, we hope, one day walk through there and be encouraged that the Word of God is true. There's nothing like this. Uh, now, there's the Holy Land Museum in Washington. It's unbelievable, the Bible Museum, they call it. But this is all, all about the history of Israel and archaeology and the relics. Pray for us as we do this project that we will be very effective. We have all the material in for it ready to go. We're making, typing out the information for the signs and things right now. We're going to start remodeling it in just a short period. In fact, by the time some of you watch this, it would be months from now, we'll be in the remodeling process. But we're so excited. And, and you know, I look at this, and I say, wow, you know, wonder who had that. This is Byzantine. This is very, very old. This goes back to, could go back, uh, according to what I've seen, it's got designs on it, you can't see, to the time of the patriarchs. And there's the, there's the official number. Everything is cleared by the, the museum, cleared through U.S. Customs, Israeli Customs, because we want to do everything right, and we do that. So anyway, uh, that's why we, because we want people to believe in the Bible. We want this younger generation to have a place to go where they can see we're going to have big sepulchers. I mean, these big bone boxes and stuff and explain the bone boxes and how. Oh, anyway, see, I'm getting carried away. Uh, subscribe to the channel. We have a lot of things to show you. And uh, if you want to go on my Facebook page, if there's a subject that you would like for me to teach on on YouTube, don't make it real long, but say, Perry, could you sometime teach on this? And we'll either do a manifest program because, and the other thing I want to share with you is we want the people, well, I'll talk about that later. I'm going to do a program, but for the people in the Midwest and the West. And so uh, we've got some things we want to have you to participate in. Got to go. Keep watching. We have an offer for you coming up. Our new offer is one of the most important prophetic teachings in the history of Manifest. Hebrew expert Bill Cloud and I teamed up on this 10-hour teaching to unlock the mysteries concealed in Israel's seven festivals. This album has 11 DVDs that are 21 30-minute lessons. They include illustrated messages and charts and pictures to enhance the details of the research. On the first DVD, I explain God's seven appointed festivals along with God's prophetic calendar. Bill Cloud then shows you a complete Passover Seder and explains the mystery of unleavened bread, unlocking its prophetic purpose, including the revelation of the Messiah. I then follow up taking you on a journey to illustrate the prophetic layers found in the Festival of First Fruits. Bill presents the fourth festival dealing with the powerful significance of Pentecost and its impact upon us today. On DVD number six, I will explain the three fall festivals and how they are yet to be fulfilled, showing how trumpets and the different shofar sounds on that day encrypt the mystery of Christ's return for His bride and the resurrection of the dead in Christ. Then I explain the biblical and ancient temple rituals of the sixth festival, Yom Kippur, and how they detail the great tribulation judgments yet to come. 
On DVD number nine, see Bill Cloud set up a sukkah walking you step by step through the practical and prophetic meaning of Israel's seventh festival, also known as the Seasons of Our Joy. Among the live audience, the most talked about DVD was lesson number 10, where I examine Israel's three biblical harvest cycles that prophetically conceal the rapture of the tribulation and the millennial kingdom through the festival harvest patterns of ancient Israel. The 11th and final DVD will stir your spirit as I reveal God's plan to restore His glory to the earth in these last days. This teaching introduces to the viewer unique Hebrew word studies, fresh biblical insight, unusual Jewish customs, and exciting prophetic truth, helping you to understand the future according to God's festival calendar. It was preached before a live audience of ministry partners, and this teaching was originally designed as a Perry Stone Bill Cloud ISO Bible course that normally is $150. However, right now you can receive the 11 DVDs as a limited time offer in an album for your donation of $75 or more. To order your set, go online at perrystone.org, call toll free 1-888-21-BREAD or write the ministry and send your donation of $75 or more to Perry Stone P.O. Box 3595, Cleveland, Tennessee 37320. Now remember when writing or calling, use offer number 11DVD101. Help keep manifest on the air. I'm looking forward to hearing from you. If you enjoyed this YouTube content, there's an important website you should know about, perrystone.org. Perrystone.org is an essential resource for the latest books, audiovisual presentations, and digital products from Perry Stone Ministries, resources that cover the same kinds of topics discussed in the program you just watched. Stop in and see all that's available at perrystone.org.